for coming. Um, who here was in Jess's talk this morning? Good. Because um, he did a talk this morning on, on sort of how you can't scale Agile. Um, and this is a talk about sort of the only two things you need to do um, to scale Agile. Uh, my name is Aaron van der Koch. Uh, originally Dutch, now live in Melbourne. Um, sort of working extensively in the sort of scaling Agile um, sort of um, field. But for people that sort of know me, uh, sort of been following me for a while, um, you go like, wait a minute, you're talking about scaling Agile? I, I don't normally talk about sort of scaling Agile. Because um, this is the stuff I talk about mostly. Um, sort of the only sustainable competitive advantage in the 21st century is this adaptability. Uh, this is sort of anyone who's ever read anything by Deming or Drucker, or sort of, it's all about that adaptability. Right? The only competitive uh, advantage, especially the only sustainable competitive advantage that you have is that adaptability. So, so what are we scaling? What are we scaling? That, that's what we're scaling. Please do not scale the agile process. Whatever, whatever process you have, that's the point is not to scale the agile process. Whatever that means. Is if we talk about if we want to talk about scaling agile, it's how do we scale adaptability? That's the interesting question. Yeah. Now, um, I've been talking about scaling frameworks for a while and debating people that teach scaling frameworks for a while. Uh, I teach some of the scaling frameworks myself. Um, so a, a, a while ago, I realized that the power of the original Agile manifesto was not in the answers. What I realized was that the power of the Agile manifesto lied in the question. The question of the Agile manifesto was not how are we all different? How are we, how are we different and which one of us is best? The power of the Agile Manifesto was that all of these different people with different um, backgrounds, different experience, different frameworks, different methodologies got together and asked themselves the question, um, how are we similar? How are we similar? And now, now we've got a bunch of these scaling frameworks. Um, some people don't sort of like to call it a scaling framework, and some people hate that it's called a scaling framework. But this is sort of uh, people, um, we're talking about uh, Save, we're talking about Nexus, Less, Spotify, Dad, all of these sort of scaling frameworks. Um, and if, if, if you look at the original manifesto, um, that's, that's sort of the, the question was, how are these similar? What are the similarities between these things? instead of the difference, because that's where we very often get to, is how is, how is, how is less different than Nexus? Well, they're similar in a lot of things, but they're different. Like, how, is, how is Spotify different than, than Safe? Well, lots of different ways. Which one's better? It doesn't, it's not an interesting question. Um, so I'm a, a, a middle-aged white guy, um, which is apparently what you need to be to be able to make manifestos. Um, so I'm, I'm perfectly suited uh, to sort of ask this question. And two things sort of stood out for me. If you look at all of these different things, the first thing that st st stands out is project funding's out. Yep, not even safe. Like the most sort of um, enterprise-friendly scaling framework talks about projects anymore. Yep. They talk about epics, which is sort of the same, but don't tell them that. Yep. And two is teams are the fundamental building block. Teams are the fundamental building block um, of, of that sort of agility. So those, in, in, in those two ways, they all of them are very, very similar. It's not, about, it's not about people, it's about people and teams. We don't care about individual productivity. We want to care about how teams deliver. So what happens if we, if we take this, if we take these two things, and dial them up to 11. What we, if, we, if we dial up this, this sort of these two um, project funding is out and sort of 
teams are the fundamental building block. What if we turn it up to 11? What do we get? Um, and this is sort of what I've been getting at for a long time, is when I talk about scaling agile, this is the stuff I want to talk about. Yeah. Product-based portfolio management. Get rid of product, get, get rid of projects. It's how do we do portfolio management based on products, not on projects. And autonomous feature teams. If you do these two things right, you'll be able to scale agile. Yeah. Miss on one of those and you're gonna fail. Yeah. And every attempt that I've done at scaling agile, every attempt that I've talked about with people, um, if you didn't do these two things, you're going to have a hard time. So that's sort of what I, what I think are the only two things um, you need to do to scale Agile. Now, I say only um, because this touches on pretty much everything in Agile, right? Everything we do, how we're doing things um, is affected by these two things. So I want to dive into them a little bit deeper. Yeah. But let's talk about product-based portfolio management. Yeah. So here's a question. Can you deliver on time, on budget, and within scope, and still be unsuccessful? Yes. Yeah. Jess was saying it this morning. Um, they, delivered, they, they delivered an unsuccessful project, a product, on time, on budget, and within scope. It's great. I don't get any points for that. I don't get any points for, um, so if this is the case, if this is the case, and it is, we all know this is the case, why are we measuring success by whether we can deliver on time, on budget, and on scope? It's, it's, it's metrics that don't make any sense because they don't measure actual value. Talk a, a story about uh, a bank I worked in. So um, I work in a bank, and, I, and at one point, um, a guy comes up to me, and let's call him Mike, because that's what his name. Um, so the Mike comes up to me, and he goes like, Erwin, I've got this amazing new idea. I've got this amazing new idea for a new product to a new set of customers in a new technology, in a new architecture, on a uh, new platform on our mainframe, new, new language on our mainframe. And I go, well, Mike, that sounds great. Um, and then he went, the dreaded question came, how much is it gonna cost? Uh, what do you want me to do, Mike? <laughs> uh, we know nothing. We don't know the customer, we don't know the product, we don't know the technology, we don't know the architecture. Um, I don't know. And he goes like, but I need to know. Okay, um, just know there's no correlation between my ability to give you a number with your need <laughs> to have a number, right? Just, you can want it all you want, I can give you um, any number. Um, and then you're like, oh, but it's for the business case. As if that made it A, better, or B, easier, right? For the business case. And I'm like, oh, well, what, my, what, we, what we can do is give us something small, right? Let's say $200,000. $200, Quarter million for banks, that's absolutely nothing, right? It's a pocket change. So just give us something small so that we can start working on it for, for a couple weeks, maybe a month or two. Um, and then we'll have at least more certainty around the, the, the technical parts. Yeah. Potentially some, some more information about the, um, the sort of product risks and all the, the things that are associated with that. And you're like, no, no, that's not, that's not possible. It's, it's for the business case. Okay. Um, so I went uh, two million. How do you know? I just told you that I don't. But you need a number. Two million is a, is a good number. It's a number. Um, and that was unacceptable, of course, because um, it was for the business case. Um, so I thought, 
this is interesting. Let, let, let me, what I'm going to try is I'm going to try and get these people a sort of uh, accustomed to a little bit of uncertainty. So I went like, well, fine, Mike. What we're, what we're going to be doing is we're going to just go away and sort of um, do some sort of testing. Um, and then sort of after about a week or so, we're going to give you a, a range uh, of estimates. Yeah, so we're going to give you a, a sort of a low, a, a low, a medium, instead of a, a high estimate on what this was going to be. And that worked. Uh, and he was like, yeah, that, 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 that makes sense. So I'm like, all right, I'll, I've, I've made some progress, right? As a sort of make getting some uncertainty in that business planning. This was, so I felt reasonably good about myself. Um, I didn't feel too good about the next week because it required us to sort of tr break this unknown problem down into an incomplete list of features, which we then had to um, estimate without any data uh, whatsoever. Um, and you know how serious we were about sort of estimating this, because the project was named Prime. Um, and for some reason, all of our estimates were prime numbers. Right? That's how serious we took this exercise. Uh, so we had an incomplete list of features with wildly inaccurate estimates, which they are by definition, right? Estimates are by, by definition inaccurate. But these were even more inaccurate than your usual inaccurate estimates. Um, and out the numbers, when we tallied everything up, um, the, uh, the likely, the, the sort of best case was 1.3 million, our, our sort of um, likely case, 1.9, and our worst case, um, uh, 2.9 million. So I felt pretty, pretty good about my, my 2 million. So, um, and Mike went away, and he came back two days later. So Mike's at my desk again two days later, and he goes, Erwin, we need to take another look at our estimates. And I'm going, why? And he goes, like, I'd like to get the number under 2 million. We need to get the number under two million. Like two numbers already are under two million, and there's no way you're going to get that third number under two million. And he was like, "No, no, no, no! You don't understand." Uh, and what it turned out, Mike had found uh, on the interweb. Mike had found uh, a magic formula uh, that transformed a uh, range-based estimates into the one through number. And I'll and I'll and I'll I'll, I'll tell you. I'll let you in on the secret. Uh, you take the uh, best case you add four times the likely case, and then the worst case, and you divide that by six. Yeah. We'll take any, any range estimate, and we'll turn it into the one through number. Um, and that now came, and, and that number was just over two million, and if we looked at the estimates, uh, so I suggested he take the likely case five times instead of four, because that would also get the number under two million. Now, the, the, the sort of, there's a lot of morals to that story. Uh, but one of the most important ones is, is just shows you how broken uh, sort of project portfolio management is. We've got this project, um, and we have to have really accurate cost estimates. Like if you were in Jess's talk this morning, uh, you know that's bullshit. Right? We need our, if, if we want to make investment decisions, uh, our cost estimates need to be exactly as accurate as our benefit estimates. Because yeah. there's no point in having more accuracy um, in, our, in our cost estimates than our, than our benefits estimates. Yeah. So next time you're being asked to do an estimate, um, ask them how accurate their benefits are, their estimate. Because yeah. they're not. They're just making shit up. So what's the problem with, with the, the sort of the problem with, there's three major problems with pro projects. Um, and especially if we then take that to that portfolio level. Yeah. The first one is a misaligned time horizon. If we're developing products and we're doing that through projects, the time horizon of our project is by definition much shorter than our product. Who here has worked on a project where a decision was made that was good for the project, but bad for the product? Right. We all have, right? We all have made decisions that was good for the project. Uh, we, we don't have time to do X properly. 
because there's, there's not enough time, there's not enough budget to do it in this project. Right? So your time horizons are very, very different. But, and that, so that's bad. What's even worse is that you have absolutely, uh, if you want to compare projects, you now have to compare every project to every other project you can do. If, we don't, if you want to do portfolio management on projects, we have to compare every project against every other project. Yeah, and that means we have to, we have to make big decisions. Uh, I worked in a lot of large corporations, um, and you cannot, you can, sort of portfolio was sort of done on that sort of exec level, um, sometimes even sort of senior um, XO type uh, levels. You cannot have them make decisions ab around 50K. There's, in a, in, in a bank, that just doesn't work. So you, ha you can only make really big decisions. If you use projects, you can only make big decisions. You cannot make small decisions. You cannot make many small decisions. The only thing you can do is make infrequent big decisions. Massive problem with projects. Um, and the absolute worst is we cannot deal with feedback. We cannot deal with feedback. Uh, there's absolutely no way we can adapt while we're working on a project. Uh, who's, who's been involved with something like UAT? Involved with sort of stuff. What's the purpose of UAT? Why do we do UAT? Two? Two? Okay. Is that true? Is that, is that true? Is the, is the purpose that we do UAT to, to validate whether the requirements? Sure. Yeah, so we, we want to, so, and that's, that's great, right? That what, what, we, what we like to think that UAT is to make sure that it's workable for our users. But it's not. Because there's no way we can do anything with that feedback. Like, there's no time. If a user goes and goes like, ah, oh, this, this screen is, doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't know. Like, where is step two? UAT is exactly what you're saying, is about acceptance. We need someone to sign on the dotted line. You have, you have gotten some, you've, you've, we've shown it to you. you. You wrote the requirements a couple months ago. Here's sort of what we have. UAT is about acceptance, not about feedback. And that's true for everything. Everything inside a project, there's no way you can adapt. There's no way you can learn. There's no way you can experiment uh, if you're doing projects. So how do we get work done if we can't do projects? Now here's, here's, um, here's two questions you have to ask your, uh, the product manager in your life. Two questions to ask them. What is more valuable? Right? Increase conversion rate by 10% or the feature that you're building now? So ask them that question. What's more valuable? The feature, is, is, is it more valuable to increase our conversion rate by 10% or is it more valuable to build the feature that we're currently building? And the second question you ask them, why are we building the feature? Because increasing conversion rate by 10% is always more valuable than whatever the hell you're doing right now. It doesn't matter what you're building. It is always more valuable to increase conversion rate by 10, 20, 30%. So why are we building the new feature and not Increasing conversion rate by 10% is because we've got no idea how we're going to increase conversion rate by 10%. We don't, I've got no clue. I know how to build that feature. I know how to build that feature. So that's the easy thing to do, is just go build the feature. 
and hope it's going to bring us more revenue. So if you have that project mindset, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can't do that's extremely valuable. And that's exactly the sort of stuff Dave was talking about in his keynote this morning, that Jess was talking about. Sort of, it's sort of that sort of theme that's been going on for, for today, is, is how do we get experimentation back into our, uh, into our work? Um, projects is the path to the dark side. Project leads to portfolios. Portfolio leads to massively delayed feedback, and delayed feedback leads to suffering. I think it was Yoda that said that. So what we want to do is we want to organize ourselves around products, organize ourselves around value, decentralize that thinking. What we want to do is we want to fund capabilities. Don't fund work. Fund capabilities. I have, I have these teams. Fund, fund the teams. Don't fund the work. Because now that we funded the teams, the, then the only question becomes is what's the most valuable thing they can do? First, furniture capabilities. And investing in those situations becomes assigning capability to products or product areas. So investing becomes, I want to invest in this product. I will give them more capabilities. I want to invest in this product. I want to invest in this capabilities. And those are the types of decisions that you can make relatively big, relatively infrequent decisions on. Your business strategy isn't going to change every sprint. It shouldn't. Right? That's sort of what we're investing in. What these people then work on, I don't know. They have to go figure that out. Yeah, oh, that was too fast. Is this clear? Sort of what that sort of product-based portfolio management is about. Organize around portfolios, uh, around products, fund capabilities, and then investing becomes assigning capabilities uh, to a product. Yeah. So if, if you're, you're now horizontally based. Yeah. Um, how, how, do you, how do you go from that horizontal model to a product model? Um, it's extremely tough. And there's no, there's no one true way um, to do that. Um, I, I, it's, a, it's very easy. So this, this is one of those things that's very simple. Right? All of this stuff is relatively simple. Um, autonomous teams I'm going to talk about. It's all very, very simple, but extremely hard to do in organizations that don't do it yet. We are, we are, we are organized around sort of systems, we organize around that systems and sort of projects, projects on systems, which is sort of the worst way to organize ourselves. Uh, to, to change that around is, is almost impossible. Um, but the thing I've seen work by far the best is um, find, find, something, find something that um, sort of important enough people care about, but can't actually get done because it's too small. That is, what, that is what I've done in a couple of the banks, where they, we'd really like to get this done, but it's only about a month or two's worth of work for two or three people. Like, like again, it's a decision that is too small to be made on that portfolio level. Um, to then go, how about, how about sort of the four of us? Just give it a shot for a month or two. Try, try and sort of, don't try and change the organization, because that's not going to work. Um, uh, what I found is, yeah, just f find something that's small. They don't, they, they care about enough, um, but, but not too much to sort of then throw five million at it. Right. Um, so that's sort of what I, what I've, how I've been successful. I'm sure there's people who have a different experience where they, they went in top down, uh, talked to the senior execs, and sort of got things changed. Um, but the way I've made it work is find something that's valuable. Um, 
but not a uh, sort of portfolio. It can't be put in a portfolio because it's too risky, uh, because it's too uncertain, or because it's too small. And then just go, why not the four of us? Just give it a go. What do you got to lose? You got, it's going to cost you 100K, 50K. What is, what, is, what is that? How much is that? Right? And then sort of show that you can do experimentation, that you can learn, that you can deliver. Yeah. But it's, it's extremely hard. Yeah. Um, all of the stuff I'm talking about is very simple, extremely hard. Yeah. Two are very, very different things. The other thing um, I talk about is autonomous feature teams. Because if we want to get adaptability, if adaptability is that only sustainable competitive advantage, what we need is decentralized decision making. We cannot make all of the decisions on the portfolio level anymore. Because we can't. We want to make, make tons of small decisions. We want to make lots and lots of small decisions. So if we want to have adaptability, we have to decentralize our decision making. There's no way around it. We have to delegate some of that knowledge, uh, some of that decision making, some of that authority um, down the chain. And the funny thing is that leads to better decisions. Because what we often now have is frontline personnel has the information. That information has to travel up to the people with authority. And then decisions have to travel down, back down. Um, to where they can actually being executed. You know, a, that's really slow, and B, it's very um, prone for errors. Right? It's very uh, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong with it. Um, so how do we push that authority down to the level uh, where the information is, so we can quickly react and we can make the right decisions? Yeah. Bringing authority down to uh, bring authority down to where the information is allows for uh, decentralized decision making. Um, and this is where product owners are so, so very valuable. Right? Product ownership is part of that product management. Um, very often, so that we talk about them, the business, and us in IT. Right? It's one of the most toxic things um, we can have um, in IT. You are, uh, very often we treat IT as a cost center. Like you're, you're, you're a cost center. We, 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 we care about how much cost. No one cares about how much value we generate. We're in this together. We, we need to shift that mindset from one where it's us versus them. It's about all of us versus the market, versus our competitors. It's pointless having arguments with our, with the, with the business. And the business is definitely not your customer. Um, who's are Facebook's typical customers? Typical customers of Facebook. All of us. Yeah. Anyone have a different opinion? Advertisers. Advertisers are Facebook's customers. Right. And if advertisers are Facebook's customers, what, what does that make us? The product. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we are the product. Right. And Facebook understands this really well. Facebook understands this really well, right? Because that's why we've got all the privacy things. And our, why, why would we have ads on our page if, if, we, were the, if we were the customer? So the business is never your customer. The business is never your customer. Um, the customer is never in, in, these, in, in the same four walls as you are. Right? Although if you can get that, it's obviously fine. So we need to sort of work together with that sort of business stakeholders. Yeah. Business stakeholders, NIT, uh, when I talk about autonomous feature teams, it's, it's not the development team I'm talking about. Right? I'm talking about everyone from the business side of things all the way down to operations. 
there, that's, that's what's a feature to me. Yeah. Um, this is kind of controversial in the agile world. Um, component teams are not agile. They're not Scrum, they're not Agile. If you work, if you work in component teams, right, you cannot be doing Agile. Right? Remember, we said working software over comprehensive documentation. And that sort of what it should have read, of course, was valuable software over comprehensive documentation. Right? We cannot deliver valuable software if we are focused um, on just our component, if, if we are part of a, an architecture, if we're if we, if we part of, if, if, if we cannot deliver anything without integrating with other, other components, we cannot be delivering valuable software. So that should be our focus, not the component. We should be talking about the value. It's all about delivering delivering valuable software. Um, now, does this sort of resemble a simplified architecture of the system you're currently working on? All right, we've got some stuff here, and then we've got some stuff in the middle, and we've got some stuff in the back end, and stuff's talking to each other. Now, what I often see is that we've got these component teams all over the place with their own backlogs. All of these component teams have their own backlogs, their own teams, their own backlogs. Um, the thing is, this makes it impossible to adapt. Because hmm? delivering might require something in A, but it most likely also requires something in D and F. Hmm? So now I need an army of project managers running around, sort of making sure my stuff's on here, on here, and on there. All right, this is the stuff uh, sort of David was talking about. Um, where Dave was talking about when you when you sort of you you have to release all of this at the same time, right. and that doesn't work. You've got sort of be here now. This this backlog here. What happens if I shift this one, then the second one, and the and the fourth one? Does anyone know what the consequences of that thing is? You don't. You've got no clue. The only way I can find out what happens if I would switch two and four is to look at all of the backlogs and basically do sort of a scenario. What would happen if I do this? Well, this would go there. And, and none of these things are valuable by themselves, or not, almost none of them are valuable by themselves. Can they have quarterly planning priorities? Sure, sure, you can have quarterly alignment, and then because and, and out of your quarterly alignment, you create the plan. Yeah. And, but during that quarter, you can actually change your plan. Right? Because changing the plan requires replanning the whole thing. And we have to get everyone in the, the room for two days to do that replanning bit. What do we do if we find, if, how can we experiment in these, in these scenarios? We can't, A, because we don't have a, a line of sight to the value, but also is, is we cannot have uncertainty in this system. Yeah. We have to execute according to plan. So how does that work without responding to change over following a plan? You've just created a quarterly plan that we can't actually change significantly um, because of all of the, um, the consequences around all these things. Yep. But, but, this is where I hear people talk, but, but, Erwin, uh, come on. Um, like Spotify, the holy grail of scaling agile. Um, don't ever say to Spotify that I said that, because um, they hate to be called that. <laughs> Um, but they've got an iOS team. Surely that sort of invalidates your component teams aren't agile. And here's the interesting thing, though. Uh, from their job ad for the iOS team, 
uh, it says this. The iOS squad is staffed with the mission to enable rapid development and deployment of the Spotify iOS client, which is key to the company's success. Simply put, this squad is building infrastructure that allows developers to quickly understand the impact of their code changes and deliver value to our end users in a reliable and timely manner. What the iOS team in Spotify does is it makes it easier and better for other developers in Spotify to, de to deliver on the iOS client. So the iOS team in Spotify does not own the iOS client. You know, not a, they're not a component team. They, they make it easier for other people to develop on iOS who are doing the, the full end-to-end -end features. Looks like I'm going to get into a discussion with Dave afterwards. It's good fun. Um, but that's sort of what they are. They're not a component team. They're a feature team, and their customers are other developers. Hmm? Surely it can't be that simple. Right? Now, the first thing to remember is um, simple doesn't mean uh, easy. Because these two things, doing these two things, um, are really simple, but impossibly hard to get to. Impossibly hard to get to uh, if, you're, if you're working in um, sort of traditional organizations. And the other sort of but, but Aaron, um, I get a lot. Um, agile is not about sort of processes. It's about being agile. It's about that mindset. And that's great. Uh, and, I, and I sort of agree that Agile isn't like the process. Um, but you cannot do any of these things without being Agile. Right? Focusing, focusing on getting these two things right will force you to become Agile. Or go back to whatever hell you were doing before. Um, which is a more likely scenario. Um, but doing these things, focusing on being agile is pretty pointless. Right? It's hardly ever, that sort of doesn't sort of work. Right? So I find sort of focusing on, on getting these two things right will force organizations to become more agile. Right? And most importantly, if you think you need a complicated methods to deal with complexity, you're obviously headed to chaos. I'm not sure if Dave Snowden ever said that. Uh, maybe if he doesn't, I'll, I'll, I'll claim that quote. Thank you very much. Sure, we have plenty of time for questions. Oh, not much. We've got a little bit of time for five minutes. Is that correct? Yep, we've got five minutes for questions. Any other questions? Yes. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, and that sort of so the, the the question was around the um, component teams, right? It's it's clear how that how that isn't sort of working. Uh, where should we go? We should have teams that are end-to-end -end responsible, um, including product uh, and including all of the skills we need to get value out to our customers, um, which often, often when people talk about sort of these feature teams, uh, they then assume that we have to have, um, we have to have teams where everyone in the teams are able to do everything in the organization, and that's not, it's not true, but sort of, for these, these teams have to be able to deliver value end to end um, by themselves to sort of get rid of these dependencies and, and get that experimentation going and get that sort of uh, responding to change and delivering value. Those are sort of the, the two things. So it's sort of how do you create teams that, um, that can deliver value basically um, is, is, is the most important thing by themselves. 
um, maybe with maybe with a, a small set of uh, sort of similar teams, uh, but that's that's the crux of it. Yeah. Anything else? Um, I, I am I'm an agile product owner. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, for support. So um, in these cases, what's the right model <coughs> when the team leverages heavily uh, for like you know, let's say 50% of their work on external teams, which function in a non-agile way? Uh, so it's painful, right? <laughs> um, and that's sort of how do you how do you get better at that? Uh, how do you uh, so the easiest thing is to build that uh, both the skill set. Uh, and a lot of the times, sort of the authorizations that come with it to start to start doing more of that, more and more of that work. Uh, so I, I often sort of get the um, so what's the, what's one of those teams um, that you have a lot of reliance on uh, where we could actually like what's the easiest and the sort of the, the biggest bang for a buck to sort of get that into our team um, and and and. Like stop thinking in people because that's what the easiest thing to do is we get we need to get one of these people into our team mm -hmm. uh, and start thinking in skills is how do we start to build this the skill set in one of our existing team members maybe getting someone else is possible but that's usually not the case it's not usually not easy to get these other people in um, but build up their skills um, uh, very often I would get I would sort of uh, give one of my team members to this other team right okay. Uh, you you go there for a sprint or two, right? See what you can do, sort of help out and learn, and then come back um, with that skill set. It's it's it it uh, brings down your productivity in the short term, but it'll massively increase it in the long term. So I, yeah, I've I've sent people, I've given people away to other teams, mm -hmm. where I just go, you go, you go help them over there. Um, ideally, to work on your stuff, uh, and that that's how I usually get it sold. Is like well, this stuff needs to integrate with my stuff. So how about I, you guys, borrow uh, Johnny there for, for while you're working on this thing, um, and he can sort of help out. is a, is a very easy way because no one no one will ever say no to more people in their team, right? They should. But that's an entirely different story, but they don't. It's like oh, we'll get more people. I've got. So that's the a very easy way to sort of build up your skills in your own team um, um, to sort of get stuck from. Decentralizing the decision making. Yes. Yeah. Under Chris Wright, that means that you decentralize ownership and accountability as well. Oh yes, yes. Is that's that a good thing or a bad thing? Ah, sort of. The, so the question was around sort of if you if you decentralize decision making, you need to decentralize ownership and and accountability. accountability. And and exactly, you, you cannot um, you, you you cannot um, delegate one without the other. It's it's definitely. Um, you definitely need to sort of get all of that down. So yeah, increased ownership, increased accountability. Uh, only then can we be able to sort of make good, proper decisions. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's an amazing thing. Um, yep. Yeah. One more done. Yeah. Thanks. Um, this is, um, Erin, you were talking about um, you know, organizing our own products and funding capability, how the investment decisions are to be made around products and teams. Um, but if you look at, um, I mean, some of the companies are product companies. They are uh -huh. a technology product. Uh -huh. But there are a lot of other companies adopting Agile who are actually, their business is not in IT. It could be financial sure. services, insurance, sure. whatever. Yep. And for them, there is a business initiative Mm -hmm. And which is, could be like launching a new product or moving into a new market, yeah. and that business initiative means a changes to a number of IT systems or yes. applications, right? Okay, so when they start looking at it from that perspective, a project, you know, automatically becomes the way to do it. I mean, that's how I I've seen a project because there's a funding for the whole initiative, and there's a deadline attached to it, and these are the changes that have to be made to a number of applications and brought into production by a certain time. Yes. So doesn't that become a project, an investing based on pro project? So yes and no. Okay. Um, so yes and no. Um, the first one is even financial companies have products. Yep. 
Um, so a lot, a lot of their project thinking uh, can go into product thinking. Right? They sell mortgages, and they sell personal loans, and they sell everyday banking, and they sell, so, and so that type of work should get into that product-based funding. Mm -hmm. right? um, and, and that's definitely something, uh, even if that hits multiple systems. Right? I've, I've spent uh, a ton of time in banks. Um, if you want to make a change to any sort of loan, you're talking like somewhere between like four and, and sort of 12, 20 systems, right? That, you, that you're going to hit yeah. depending how serious it changes. That's still product-based thinking because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a change that's made from that product thinking. Um, now, there is one exception where, where you have to do projects, uh, and you sort of touched on that slightly, is if I, for example, want to ro roll out into a new market. Yeah. Um, and the only exception, the, 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 time you, the only time you're forced to go to projects is if you have to coordinate over multiple products. Yeah. If I have to do one thing over multiple products, yeah. uh, I, have to do a, uh, I have to do a project. Yeah. So when I say you should never do projects, you should only do projects in that one, one specific change. Uh, but it's not nearly as good a sound bite. Um, but yeah, you've touched on the one, mm -hmm. the one reason to do projects if I want to coordinate something over multiple products. Yeah. But most of it, even for banks, most of their stuff like almost all of their stuff can still be done in that product-based thinking. Um, it's only when you want to coordinate over multiple products that, you, that you're forced to um, do something like a project. Um, and that's sort of um, the, 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 the thing that um, uh, I was talking to one of the Spotify guys a, a year or two ago, one of their coaches. Um, and and their, their, their thing was, yeah, we, they, they do a project every couple years. And every single time they regret it. <laughs> it's hard. I can't believe people do this all the time because it's, it's projects are hard. It's multiple, multiple stakeholders, multiple teams. They have to coordinate and get things done at the same time. And um, sort of, yeah, they're, they're hard to do well. So don't, don't do them unless you absolutely have to. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be outside uh, if you have any more questions and, or uh, want to answer. Thank you very much.